Phylum Annelida is the segmented worms. So this is our second worm phylum. The name Annelida means little rings. And when you look at the body of these worms, they do appear to have little rings that encircle their bodies. So that will divide them up into segments. So these are our segmented worms. In addition to that, these are going to have a true coelom. So they're going to have a true body cavity that's fluid filled. It's going to help to cushion the interior from um, outer forces. So it's going to help to protect the organs. And it's also going to be used a lot for movement in these particular cases. We have two major groups within the Annelida and those are represented on this slide here by the two different pictures. So we have the earthworm at the top, which is more of a smooth bodied worm. And then we have the one at the bottom, which looks like it has little feet or hairs all along it. So we're gonna talk about that one at the bottom first. The one at the bottom is in the group polychaetes. These have all those little hairs on them and those are what we call parapodia. So parapodia, they are um, little feet that are going to function in locomotion. So these are gonna help them to move around. Um, and then on the parapodia themselves, there's going to be structures which we call keta. The keta, these um, are made up of chitin. These are little bristles of chitin. And these are going to function as gills. So we're gonna have quite a lot of those in the polychaetes. And that's really where the name is coming from here. Most of these species are going to be marine species. The other group that we have is the oligochaetes. And this is represented by earthworms and then leeches. These are going to have a lot fewer keta. So we won't see near as many of those as what we had before. So they're gonna appear a lot smoother. And the earthworms, those are known for burrowing down in the earth. And then we also have the leeches. Um, leeches are parasitic. They will attach to an organism. They're going to have little teeth that can cut a little slit in the skin. Most of them um, secrete some type of anesthetic so that you don't feel when they slit the skin. And then they suck the blood or ingest blood um, out of that host organism. If we look at the internal structure of an earthworm, so an oligochaete, um, we can notice several things about this. They do have that true coelom. That's going to help to protect the organs inside. It's also going to be very important for movement in this case. And another thing that they have um, is they are going to have a closed um, circulatory system. So notice that we do have vessels which are going to contain the blood. So we have that closed circulatory system. We also have um, a head structure that's got a cerebral ganglia. So this is going to be our simple brain structure here. We have nerve cords that are gonna run throughout the body. And if we talk about their reproduction, most of these are going to be hermaphrodites. So that means that they're going to be able to um, produce both egg and sperm, but they do tend to cross fertilize with each other. So that part's going to be important for um, genetic variation in them, which is going to help them to adapt to their environment. And some of them are also able to reproduce by division. The next clade of invertebrates that we're going to discuss is the ectisozoans. And these um, are known for this process of molting that they go through. So these tend to have some type of a cuticle that is going to be shed at some point and then they'll regrow another cuticle on top of where that one had been. This is going to include our largest of all of the invertebrate phylums that we have. And there's eight total animal phyla that fall into this group and we're gonna discuss really just two of them. So if we discuss the first one, the first one, which is phylum nematoda, is a worm phylum. So this is the last group of worms that we're going to discuss. And hopefully at this point, you've noticed um, or come to 
recognize that when we say worm, that's a very generic term. It just means it's kind of a long, slender animal, but we do have three total phylum that we discussed for worms. So we had the flatworms, which was the platyhelminthus. We had the segmented worms, which was Annelida. And now we have nematodes, which is Nematoda. These are some of the most ubiquitous organisms. So by ubiquitous, you can find these everywhere. So these are very common in the soil. They're very common in freshwater, in marine environments. They are all over the place. They tend to be very tiny. These are going to have no segments at all. And these are going to be pseudocelomates. Now, one thing that is very distinctive about them, and hopefully you're seeing this in the picture here, is that these have longitudinal muscles. So notice that they have um, these lines that are running down the whole length of the worm. So these longitudinal mus muscles are distinctive, and they're going to produce kind of a thrashing movement when the worms move. So it, just looks kind of a wild um, movement that doesn't seem to have any real direction to it. They also tend to have a very tapered end. So their end is very tapered um, compared to the other worms that we look, like, looked at. These are going to have um, internal fertilization. And these also have separate sexes. So we have um, male nematodes and we have female nematodes. Many of the nematodes are going to be parasites. So we have some that are parasites of animals. We have a lot of them that are parasites of plants. So you find a lot of them in soils. They are very good at evading host immune responses, which is something that's very important if these are going to be parasites. They have a very tough um, outer covering to them, which is going to help with this. The second phylum that we're going to talk about that's part of this clade that includes molting organisms is arthropoda. This is the arthropods. This group gets a lot of attention because this is the largest of all of the invertebrate phylum. And there's a huge number of arthropods on the Earth's surface. It's estimated that there is 10 to the 18th in the number of organisms that we have. So tons of um, arthropods around us, very, very large phylum. Most of these are going to be insects. So we'll spend a little bit of time on that particular group within the arthropods. But if we talk about um, what makes them arthropods, first of all, these are going to have segmented bodies. So they're all gonna have segmented bodies. This is going to allow the individual sections of the body to specialize in different activities. These are going to have a hard exoskeleton. And this is an exoskeleton that's going to be made up of chitin. And then another thing that's going to be very important for them is that they're going to have jointed appendages. So these are jointed appendages, um, in some cases, the organisms will have a whole bunch of different jointed appendages. They're going to be able to specialize in different activities also. The fossils for the arthropods started to first appear during the Cambrian period. And early arthropods had a lot of segments to them. So if you look at this fossil on this slide, you can see lots of different segments. But over time, those segments became fused together. So over time, we start to see fewer and fewer segments. And this had to do a lot with the Hox genes. So there are definitely Hox genes that are involved in segmentation um, determination in insects. And it allowed, again, the different regions of the insect body to become specialized for different activities. Now, if we look at an example, of an arthropod. Here we have a lobster, and a lobster has a lot of different appendages. So it's a good example to really look at those jointed appendages and what we're talking about with that. These are specialized for all different types of activities. So we do have the pinchers, which are gonna be for defense. We have antenna on the head, 
and we can have um, multiple antenna. In this case, we have two pairs of antenna, um, which are for sensory reception. We have legs for walking. We have ones that are for swimming. So we have ones for feeding, lots of different mouth parts, um, and just overall jointed appendages, which is really where the name for this group comes from, all of those jointed appendages. The whole body is going to be covered by a cuticle, which is the exoskeleton, and that exoskeleton is going to be made up of chitin. That exoskeleton is going to provide a lot of protection because it is oftentimes a very hard, um, rough surface, which will protect those internal organs from getting damaged. Since it is such a hard, um, rigid exoskeleton, it's not going to grow with the arthropod. So this means that when the organism is going to grow, there's going to have to be a shedding or a molting of that exoskeleton. So they're going to get rid of that and then a new one will be rebuilt that can accommodate the new um, size of the individual organism. Overall, the exoskeleton is going to help to prevent desiccation. So it's going to prevent drying. And then it also is gonna provide some structural support, which is important because we're talking about the move to land in many cases, not all of them are on land. But if they do move to land, we're gonna need some support that's going to help to hold that body upright once we get out of the water. Now, if we talk about the groups of arthropods, um, there's several different major groupings. The chelicerates is the first one that we wanna talk about here. And you can see on this slide the groups that are included. This is going to include horseshoe crabs, which is what we have up here at the top, which is a very primitive um, arthropod. We have ticks, and then we also have arachnids, um, which would be the spiders, and then you can see the scorpion down here on the bottom. What these are really known for is the fact that they have chelicera. And these chelicera, these are claw-like, fang-like appendages which are used for feeding. So if you think fangs, that's what these have. So we can see that on the tick right here. You can see them on the spider up here. That's where the name comes from. That's one of the things that's gonna kind of hold this particular clade together. So many of the ones that we have today that fall into this grouping are what we would call arachnids. If we look at the internal anatomy of a typical spider, um, some of the things that we wanna point out is, again, we do have chelicerae. These are the fangs for which this grouping is named for. Many of these arachnids are gonna have poison glands that is going to help with the feeding because these are going to be predators. In the case of spiders, these are going to have special structures that are going to help them to spin a web that they will use for their feeding. We're going to have what we call book lungs. Now these book lungs are going to be for gas exchange. They have a lot of different um, flaps or pages, which is where the name book lungs comes from. That's going to increase the surface area, which is going to help them be more successful on land because they're gonna have better respiration. This is going to give them more surface area for exchanging carbon dioxide and oxygen gas. Another thing that's unique about um, the arachnids is the number of walking legs that they have. So they have four pairs or eight total walking legs that they're gonna use. And they also have um, sensory appendages which are called pedipalps. So these will help them to sense, um, in some cases, vibrations, and that could be for feeding or for reproduction purposes as well. So sometimes when we're talking about spiders, we have some mating rituals that take place. Those will be involved in that. The myriopod group includes the millipedes, which is what we're seeing on the top here. And then we also have centipedes, which is what you would see um, in the far picture. So the millipedes and the centipedes, all of these are terrestrial organisms. And these are best known for the fact that they have antenna. And then they have three pairs of modified mouth parts. 
So these are going to be used for feeding. These are going to be, um, they're going to have mandibles and then they're also going to have some other modified mouth parts. The millipedes, they have more walking legs to them. So with a millipede, each, le each segment has two pairs of legs. So that's on each segment and they have a lot of segments to them. So if you look um, at even the one down here on the bottom, you can see there's lots of segments there. When we're talking about the centipedes, these are going to have a lot fewer. So these have one pair of legs per segment and the centipedes tend to be, these are carnivores. They um, do have some poison claws that they can use to help to paralyze their prey. When we're talking about the millipedes, the millipedes tend to just eat decaying matter. So two groups here, millipedes, centipedes, they differ in um, how they obtain their food and they also differ in the number of walking legs that they have. So those are the major differences between the two groups.